Hello, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whatever you are. Welcome to today's webinar of the Gerhard Center webinar series, The Aftermath of COVID-19, The New Social Impact Ecosystem. Today, we're very honored to have with us Catherine Belvoda smith to speak about 21st century corporate citizenship. A corporate citizenship, you probably have heard it in a variety of names, corporate CSR, corporate social responsibility, corporate sustainability, corporate responsibility, all the terms boil down to the same thing, building, building a more ethical, resilient, and sustainable way of doing business. Now, we couldn't find better actually than Catherine to talk about this topic. She has a, a book, a co-authored uh, book with the same title, and she's the executive director of the Center for Corporate Citizenship at Boston College, Carroll School of uh, Management, and she serves as a part-time faculty at the Carroll School of Management, where she teaches business in society. As an executive director, she leads the team, oversees content, events, and strategic partnerships that contribute to the organization's success. She has worked with private, public-private partnership for more than 20 years through her career in profit, in nonprofit, and higher education. Without much ado, I will pass it to uh, I'll pass the floor to uh, Catherine. Catherine, thank you for joining us. And please, it's sold. It's, it's yours. Thank you, Ali. So good to be with you. So please, uh, first, I want to just start by saying thank you for having me with you and very honored to be here with the center. Um, if you have questions along the way, please feel free to throw them into chat as we go. Don't feel like you need to wait until the end. I'm happy to take questions as we as we go. I thought it would be helpful to start by giving you a little overview of the center. So, so like your center, we exist in a university in the School of Management at Boston College. The Center for Corporate Citizenship has been uh, in existence for, um, sorry about that, for uh, 35 years, uh, roughly. We're in our 35th year. Uh, we are a world leader in corporate citizenship research and education based in the Carroll School of Management at Boston College. Um, we're the oldest organization of our kind dedicated to corporate citizenship. We have more than 470 member companies and how our center works, we are a department of the Carroll School of Management at Boston College but 100% of our attention is focused on our member companies. So any company that's operating a legal business um, uh, anywhere in the world can join the Center for Corporate Citizenship and we support that team, that corporate citizenship team with research, education, benchmarking, all media monitoring, regulatory monitoring, all kinds of tools um, that they can use to make their corporate citizenship practice more effective. Uh, and we've been doing this for 35 years. We, we did it uh, in response to the Community Reinvestment Act in the United States, which was um, an act that was actually uh, uh, passed in response to the, the banking practice of redlining, which is that banks were, um, were actually, sorry about that, I'm losing my, um, screen, banks were, uh, were not lending to communities of color uh, specifically because they were, were saying that they were too high risk. So the um, African-American, Hispanic communities in the United States were being denied access to capital. And this legislation, the Community Reinvestment Act was founded, was created to uh, provide redress for that. When that legislation was passed, a group of banks came to the president of Boston College and said, you know, we now have to make lots of social impact investments in our communities. We don't really have the expertise to do this. Can you help us develop our people so that we can do this work more effectively? And uh, Father Monin at that time said, yes, absolutely, we will do that. And so the Center for Corporate Citizenship was founded with 25 banks initially, and today it's grown to more than 470 uh, member companies. So when we talk about corporate citizenship, we're not talking only about what happens in the philanthropy, philanthropy department. We're talking about the combination of rights, responsibilities, obligations, and privileges that happen across the firm and how the firm shows up in society writ large. So you know, no uh, philanthropy program, no employee volunteer program, no, uh, you know, no uh, cause marketing program 
is going to substitute for for being ethical and sustainable in your operations. So even if you are a practitioner in the world of corporate citizenship, we want you to uh, pull the lens back in terms of how you're thinking about what's being communicated about your program and what your opportunities are in the company to use the assets of business to create not only long-term value for the firm, but also um, value for society. So that's our purpose and that's the work of the center. So when we're talking about um, corporate citizenship defined and those responsibilities and obligations versus rights and privileges, th these are the uh, boundaries that we're talking about. Responsibilities and obligations would be to pay taxes, or uh, these are obligations, pay taxes, obey the law. Provide employment might be a responsibility. It might also be an obligation depending on the nature of the company. Produce safe product. Uh, you, again, you want the product to be as safe as it can be in its category, but some would argue that there is no such thing as a safe tobacco product. Treat employees fairly, invest in communities, a responsibility, not necessarily an obligation unless you're a bank, protect the environment, help solve social issues, et cetera. Rights and privileges, the rights are pursuit of profits, legal personality, le limited liability, perpetual lifetime, and fair competition. Privileges are the license to operate within communities and society could actually put pressure on companies, um, whether or not they're going to have that license to operate depending on how they behave. So these comprise the social contract and they exist in a state of constant negotiation. Um, Ali, I mean, I've actually lost my uh, Zoom. So if you would just yell out if there's a question that would be great in the chat at any point and I'd be happy to stop. You with me? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm. I'm. I'm asking about sharing your your uh, your slides. If you need to share them. Ah, oh, that's why. Yes. No worries. Okay. Okay. So when we think about the dimensions of corporate citizenship, they are united by uh, what we would call multi-stakeholder governance. And we look at, uh, and these slides will be provided to you also. So you have the, the social contract, uh, you know, the rights and privileges, obligations, and responsibilities that we just discussed. All of these will be shared with you uh, after the presentation. So when we think about how these are put into practice, the guideline that we use as the overarching guideline is the ISO 26000 International Standard on Social Responsibility. This is the framework to which um, pretty much every global standard rolls up. So it provides that global sense, consensus on what it means to be a responsible company. And it's aligned with the other standards such as the SDGs, the Global Reporting Initiative or GRI, the OECD guidelines on multinational organizations, et cetera. At the center of all of these standards is the principle of multi-stakeholder governance. And this is oftentimes the, um, the thing that's most uh, difficult for companies to actually wrap their, uh, their practices around because they think of governance as corporate governance, which is a very hierarchical shareholder focused kind of undertaking. Um, today, I think it's, you know, broadly and becoming even more broadly accepted that we should take more of a stakeholder perspective and a longer um, time horizon uh, in terms of how we think about the valuation of companies. And that um, has been emphasized recently here in the United States by some of the larger global investment companies, most specifically BlackRock and Vanguard stepping forward to say that they expect their portfolio companies, which if you look at their portfolios, those two investment firms, it pretty much means any global 250 company, they're gonna be a top 10 shareholder, um, and definitely any of the Fortune 1000 in the United States, they are going to have to adhere to a new way of thinking about how they, uh, how they account for both value and risk in terms of their environmental, social, and governance um, dimensions. 
So multi-stakeholder governance that takes into account um, you know, the, the uh, con concerns and the valuations beyond the shareholder uh, govern these six dimensions, which include human rights, labor, fair labor, so making sure fair remuneration, working conditions, et cetera, fair operating practices, meaning that they're not undermining other companies and they are um, maintaining a stable supply chain, consumer protection, environmental protection, and community in involvement and community development. Those are the dimensions, all of which are governed by a multi-stakeholder consultative process um, at the center of decision-making, which is not to say that the stakeholders all of a sudden wrestle control um, necessarily from the company. It is more to say that the company leaders are getting more engaged in listening to what is uh, of concern and to understanding the concerns of, of stakeholders, um, not only because that's the just and right thing to do, but also because if they are not paying attention to those stakeholders, they may actually be um, leaving aside opportunities to understand risk in their operating context. So more companies are coming um, towards this practice. So um, a huge uniting uh, framework has been in the last um, several years, the Sustainable Development Goals, which uh, set forward 17 different goals, right, that are, uh, that are supported by 169 different uh, sub-objectives and more than a thousand different indicators of those objectives. And companies are using that sustainable development goal framework as a way to organize their work so that they can, um, they can actually aggregate the progress towards these goals. And, uh, you know, progress has been, um, the, the work of aggregating has frankly been very uneven. Um, the place where most companies go is to the partnerships for the goals, which is, tends to be a soft goal, not an outcome-oriented goal, uh, but, a, out, um, not, but a, you know, it's more of an, an output-oriented goal. Um, so sustainable cities and communities has, has been big, reduced inequalities has been big, quality education has been big in terms of the uh, emphasis jobs and economic growth has been big in terms of the emphasis of uh, companies in the US. Um, the other thing to understand, I think, about the US context specifically is that um, something like 26% in any given year of our GDP comes from financial services, which means that we are you know, earning a lot more of our um, value, value and equity in this country through financing enterprises elsewhere um, than in making things uh, ever before. So that's an interesting situation for the United States. I know that's not the situation in, in Egypt. And every, um, every country is going to have its own interesting constraints uh, related to its own uh, e economy, of course. So when we think about how global corporate citizenship should function, we really think about this as an enterprise-wide undertaking. So you have business units in your company where you're developing strategy, you're informing your functions, whether it's HR or finance or operations of your business requirements, you're executing your business strategies and you're developing results, right? You're delivering results on your P&L. The functions go across and support this work, right? So you have finance operations, uh, human resources, plant sales, R&D, marketing, et cetera. Corporate citizenship lays over all of these functions. So how you finance your projects. Um, in operations, how you're buying raw ingredients, goods and services, et cetera. All of those, uh, those aspects actually should be informed by that OECD governance process. Are you, uh, are you using a sustainable um, sourcing strategy? Are you sure that human rights are observed in your supply chain? Are you operating your plant in the most sustainable way possible? Are you capturing all the energy that you're creating, using every opportunity to be more sustainable? Are you selling in an ethical way to your customers? Are you supporting their sustainability objectives? 
are you looking to, to develop through your research and development uh, platform new, more sustainable, more ethical uh, uh, products that are more available to more people? So those are all the questions we want our member companies to be um, asking and delivering on those promises. And here are some examples of how companies have organized to do that. So this is Hewlett Packard Company, which is a computer peripherals company. Um, and you will see in the most high functioning of these organizations, they will have um, decision-making related to corporate citizenship happening in a collaborative way at the executive level. So while they have all of these individual work streams that are leading up to the councils, committees and expert advisors, they have a pan Hewlett Packard Global Citizenship Council, which deals with all of their regional leads and all of their functional leads. It's the opportunity for those groups of people to come together and to make recommendations to the executive council, which includes the CEO, about what should be happening with the HP in terms of its sustainability and, and uh, people development um, process, processes. So that's one example. This is another, which is Toyota, which is again, a global um, operating company that is based in Japan and in Texas and in many other places around the world, but they have in their global, um, their global leadership processes, a sustainability meeting that brings together supervisory board meetings, including their independent directors, their internal and external audit, um, groups, their disclosure committees, and those folks are all reporting to the operating executive so the decisions can be made and recommended to the board of directors. So it's a, a process that's pretty high up in the company. So they're taking the external inputs of their stakeholder groups and bringing those to the attention of their operating officers. Um, this is General Mills, which is a food company. They both uh, are growing uh, row crops and also developing uh, ex extruded grain products mostly. Um, but they are working again with their VP of global sourcing with the sustainability group. Um, and they have the sustainability governance committee, which, which includes the CEO and chairman of the board, the, the EVP for supply chain, um, the EVP for in Innovation, Technology, and Quality, and the Global Chief Marketing Officer, who are making recommendations to the CEO and Chairman of the Board, who reports to the Board of Directors. So all of, all of those folks are bringing inputs from their stakeholder groups from outside of the organization to the table for discussion um, and making decisions at a pretty high level. Now, Dave and I did write a book, Ali mentioned this, and I'm gonna go through the first four chapters very briefly. And I'm giving uh, that all of the 10 chapters summaries are, um, are here and Ali will distribute to them, them to you after the meeting, along with a report called The State of Corporate Citizenship, which is our most recent look at how companies are thinking about these issues. But I thought it would be, um, helpful to look at this because this book is intended not as a what you should do book. And, and this is, these are Ali's words, which I think are very um, clever and useful. And I'm going to adopt them from here on in. It's how you should do things, not what you should do. So the book outlines a set of processes that help you think through how you set up um, operating practices that allow you to respond to your operating context and to engage continually with your stakeholders, both inside and outside of the company. So, um, you know, strategy, change management, organizational design, they look difficult, but they don't have to be. They're not, it's not rocket science, but it is work and there is no substitute to doing every step of the work. Um, the book is designed to be for practitioners, a step-by-step -step process to comprehend you know, what you can do in your company to create an effective corporate citizenship program. And at the end of every chapter, there are 10 questions which you could actually hand to an executive. Um, and if you have done all the steps in the chapter, you would both be able to uh, give your executive the questions that they should be asking about what your 
um, whether your program has checked every box it needs to check in order to be effective. And the chapter would have given you a way to answer all of those 10 questions. So I just want to cover the first four because they're at the core of this. And then we can um, go to Q&A. Um, but chapter one is do connect your corporate citizenship to your business purpose. So when we talk about purpose, right? Purpose is the reason that your company exists. Um, and why you are uniquely purpose, uniquely situated and able to fulfill a, a, a need that the economy and the society presents, right? So um, for 3M, it's to solve the world's unsolved problems, right? There, uh, there, you think about what 3M does, they make sticky notes. But what do they really do? They, they really think about how to solve those little nagging problems or big nagging problems that prevent um, designers, thinkers, engineers from being able to uh, build the things they want to build. So um, reusable adhesive was one of those problems. They solved that problem. Um, so do take time to really understand your company's core purpose, right? Versus the mission, right? The, purpose is the reason you exist. The mission is the objective you're moving towards in terms of um, your, your strategy, right? And all of the tactics underneath that are the steps that you take to hit, hit that mission. Um, your mission can change over time, right? Think about um, how McDonald's actually shows up in the world. A U.S. company um, here in the United States based on providing fast, affordable, family-friendly meals in clean, fun environments. What those meals look like in the United States versus what they look like in India are very different things. In the United States, you know, the meals are almost 100% beef-based. In India, the meals are 100%, almost 100% vegetarian. So the 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 purpose doesn't change across those two contexts, but the way that they fulfill their mission is very different in the context. And that's a way for you to think about your strategy. So think about what is your real purpose for existence and look at the corporate citizenship opportunities across your company's value chain and business process flow um, and do what you do best. So th sometimes what we see is that companies actually get anxious about doing something that's in their core wheelhouse because they feel like they're going to be seen as being self-serving. What Dave and I would both say is that it's very important for you to undertake corporate citizenship that's connected to your purpose and strategy because that's what your company's most likely to stick with for the long term. And sticking with an initiative for the long term will actually help you learn more about how to do it better. You can create a virtuous cycle of actually improving your performance over time. And it's not on the chopping block every time you hit a lean period. So do connect to purpose and strategy. Don't try to replicate the programs of others. It might not work in your context. Um, although I do firmly believe as most innovators do that you should always be looking at what others are doing for ideas. Make it work for your context. Don't plan programs that exceed your capabilities or resources. They are doomed to failure. And don't define your competition too narrowly. So when you're looking around at, uh, at what you might do in terms of improving your corporate citizenship uh, profile, you don't only have to look in your industry and your direct competitive set, you can look in your geography, you can look at places where you might be uh, competing for wallet share. Um, so be creative about the sources. Do create advantage in your marketplace. So do be proactive about sur surveying your market landscape. Do know who your important customers are. Do monitor and engage activists and adv advocacy groups and keep track of issues as they emerge and evolve. So um, the pandemic is a great, uh, great example of this, right? So uh, keep track of is issues as they emer emerge and evolve. So I looked back at the uh, Google Trends. You can go to trends.google.com and look for keywords and see when they started showing up. Back in um, November of last year, and even late October, the uh, 
the pandemic uh, searches were heating up in Wuhan, China. I mean, we didn't see it because we weren't um, wanting to see it maybe, but that pandemic issue was already emerging well before it really uh, hit, hit us globally in February. So I think, you know, having a monitoring process can be a very important piece of um, work. Dave Stangus, my co-author of this book, actually uh, was the chief sustainability officer in two different industries. One was food production for Campbell Soup. The other was for um, Intel chip production. And both of those companies um, had different issues, you know, and, and some overlapping uh, issues. So for example, uh, the, the uh, availability of fresh water and the need to be able to recycle wastewater was common to both industries. Those were issues that Dave always had to have on his radar. When he moved to Campbell's, he also had to add cage-free eggs, uh, genetically modified organisms, et cetera. So understanding where these issues could be percolating up and having somebody keep track of them or keeping track of them yourself, very important. Don't focus on shareholders or owners exclusively. Don't forget to watch what's other, happening in other contexts. You know, we were not watching what was happening in Wuhan, China nearly as closely as we should have been watching um, in the fall of last year. Um, and don't be a laggard in discussion and disclosure. So one of the big challenges for companies in terms of sustainability and in terms of um, thinking about that multi-stakeholder uh, consultative governance process, um, many leaders and companies are afraid to engage with stakeholders, especially activist stakeholders, because they're afraid that they're going to be um, beholden, right? That it's a risk to be talking. And in our experience, engaging with conversation has in 99% of the cases bought time for the company to develop a response and also has helped them understand um, what their responses could be, what the range of responses could be. So don't let your fear of um, attack, I guess, or um, prevent you from being in conversations that could be very helpful to uh, coming to positive business solutions. Don't forget that uh, all issues are activated by stakeholders. So chapter three is of the people, for the people, by the people. And our point there is, uh, is remember that corporate citizenship begins and ends with stakeholders. So um, the environment is what we would call a, vo a voiceless stakeholder because it doesn't actually speak, but it has advocacy organizations that speak on its behalf as proxies. Social justice organizations speak for huge segments of the society who may or may not have much voice. Um, also think about your employees, your internal stakeholders who, who help you to deliver on the promise of your purpose and on your value proposition every day. Uh, your customers, your suppliers, your investors, uh, those all have voices. Customers vote with their feet, right? Suppliers actually could also vote with your feet depending on, on, um, on how readily available the ingredients or raw materials are, uh, but be in dialogue with those folks, those stakeholders all the time. Don't focus on issues not relevant to your key stakeholders, even if it's the most burning issue of the day. If it's not your issue, don't be distracted by it. Um, don't forget to monitor for, for opportunities as well as risks, because sometimes new way, look at what happened with Zoom. Like Zoom was a little teeny weeny company until February of last year. And now everybody does everything on Zoom 24 seven, 365. Um, don't overlook human resources to help you understand the issues that may be most important to your employees. And finally, and then we'll turn it over to questions. Um, do connect corporate citizenship to your business strategy. So understand your company's business strategy. I oftentimes we're in uh, working with the firm and we come to, to realize that maybe the people who are executing corporate citizenship don't understand key aspects of the strategy. So do take the time to uh, understand how your company intends to grow, 
how it makes money, <laughs> how it, um, you know, where your potential long-term and short-term risks are and what the alternatives to those risks are they might, uh, that might offer opportunities. Do learn how corporate citizenship can support key business objectives. So when you look at a Walmart, for example, um, Walmart has actually interestingly been a leader in sustainability and not because of a values-based decision initially. I think it has become a values-based uh, initiative for the company. But initially they were looking to reduce packaging and water so that they could get more product on their shelves and also reduce shipping costs, you know, less water means lighter product, higher volume of product in a more concentrated form. So that was their initial push. What they've come to understand as they stepped into that whole arena of reducing packaging and waste is, is the, the rest of sustainability. They're now um, one of the biggest producers of solar power in the United States because they have the most extensive roof space to be able to, to um, collect sunlight. They um, have done a, a ton with waste reduction, uh, with, uh, with changing uh, the transition from incandescent bulbs to LEDs over time, et cetera. So they have actually been a tremendous leader um, in terms of pushing sustainability because they have the scale to be able to do that. The, they are an interesting example because on the flip side, they really struggle to, um, to do the social kinds of uh, things that they should do. They do have a foundation. Their foundation is very generous. The Walton family who are the founders are still very involved, but the way they treat their employees leave something to be desired. And that's been a problem for them. So they still have that nut to crack. And that's not uncommon either. Many companies do some aspects of corporate citizenship very well, but they struggle with others. So you wanna play your best game, best and highest game wherever you can, uh, connecting to your business strategy and then work at making the, your deficits better over time. Um, don't employ corporate citizenship tactics just because other companies do. Don't fail to write a plan and don't forget to communicate the plan again and again and again and again because audiences do yield to repetition. The average person needs to hear something though three to five times to even be able to recall it. Um, that's 55% of the people. Another 20% of people need to hear it as many as 10 times. So by the time you can't stand to hear yourself talking about your corporate citizenship plan one more time, it's probably the first time your audience is hearing you. So I'm gonna pause there and um, we're at 30 minutes. You can, I have summaries of the other chapters available for you in the presentation as well, Ali. We'll send them out after the webinar. Um, along with our state of corporate citizenship report, and I am happy to take questions from anybody. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, I wanna, I'm going to ask you a few questions, and I have two comments. I mean, the first question I wanted to ask is about, you wrote the book in 2017. Now, in the aftermath of COVID-19, what would you have changed or added to the book? So I, that's a great question, Ali, thank you. Um, I think because the book is a how-to book, uh, there isn't a lot I would have changed because really the book tells you how to monitor your environment, internal and external environment for risks and opportunities. However, I do think that I, we might have added a chapter, a more explicit chapter on um, taking care of people. So inclusion, both economic inclusion and also um, you know, protection inclusion, because what we've seen in the United States, especially, and this may be true in Egypt as well, is that uh, the lower wage workers are the most vulnerable to the pandemic crisis and also the least protected. Um, and that's clearly untenable, unjust. It does not make for a strong, healthy, vibrant society that can support a healthy economy. So I would have spent maybe a chapter on the things that companies should do for people. It's, it's interesting and it will sort of sync well with the chapter three of the people, for the people, by the people. This is really democratizing economy and uh, led by corporates. A very interesting title. Now, 
I I have a quote from you, and I think it was a trying to sort of uh, promote the corporate uh, citizenship. It, it says the science and art of corporate citizenship are fundamental to differentiated business success. Now, we're always talking when we're trying to sort of promote corporate citizenship. We always try to sort of say we create social value. Hence, there is a social capital that is created. This is how we try to, we never try to continue, position it as this is the right thing to do. And I, I can see the, a big difference. I mean, uh, the right thing to do would require an ecosystem governance that is very strong. Because what's going to sort of force you to sort of do the right thing is really either industry uh, self enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, is financial institutions uh, enforcing certain uh, uh, like like the ISO 2600 mm -hmm. or government and social uh, and civic society organizations so it's a much but, harder much harder game yes but it's more inclusive it's big it's wider wider impact right the, the problem the problem is uh, and I can't remember who made this this comment, right? There are no permanent, uh, it's one of the British prime ministers in the 1800s, Temp Templeton maybe. There are no permanent friends. There are no permanent enemies. There are only permanent interests. So this is a very political statement. And I think it's relevant here because when we talk about doing what's right, what's right? <laughs> like The big question is, according to whom? Right. And in the United States, especially in the last year, as we've been watching this uh, political um, campaign unfold and the results of the election unfold, it's very clear that even though Joe Biden won the election by a wide margin, there's still, you know, 40 some percent of this country who think that what Biden is proposing is not right. So, and those people exist at every level. They're not just stupid, you know, we don't have a, I don't think we have a, a country that's made up of for, literally 40% imbeciles. There are people who strongly believe that, um, that the world is changing in a way that they don't agree with, <laughs> right? And in the only way we get them to, or we get more consensus about what we should be doing is if we can get to those you know, permanent interests, no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, no, only permanent interests. Okay. So understanding the interests of the company and anchoring the program in the interest of the company, I think makes for better longevity and success for the program. If you're looking to make an investment. And I think that's the, that's the value that, uh, you know, Larry, uh, Larry Fink from BlackRock, actually stepped forward and said, I expect all of my portfolio companies to report to the uh, ta task force on climate related um, financial disclosures framework this year. He's by saying that he's saying, I believe that climate is a significant operating risk to every company everywhere. And all of you better see that too and plan for it, or I'm going to downgrade my view of the quality of management in your company. So that's a big statement that carries with it, it carries with it a, a shared business interest. Those the executives who are being forced to report want to be seen as high quality managers. Larry Fink wants them to incorporate assessments of risk into their financial accounting, climate risk into their financial accounting. So that is a way to create a shared interest, I think. I have an interesting quote from John Ilkington, who was one of the webinar speakers a few weeks back. Again, a review of the book. He says, repositioning capitalism for tomorrow's environmental, social, and governance challenges will be difficult, but not impossible. If you are determined to walk the walk, not just talk the talk, read, read on. So I think he's implying in some sense that there are many companies that they do it just because of look good, not because really they are interested in doing good. 
Is that I a think, fair assessment or uh, this is just too harsh? I think that's a fair, that could be a fair assessment, but that that assessment could be because they haven't, the people in those companies haven't yet had the opportunity to understand how it's in their interest. Right. Okay. And I will say that on, on every side and every corporate citizenship issue, there is an individual citizenship issue on the other side. So you think about petroleum products, right? If, if we didn't, if we weren't desperately hungry for all of those products. And now like, you know, the products include things like PPE syringes, um, you know, fuel for super, uh, super freezers, all those things that we not only want, but we need, right? It wouldn't be pumped out of the ground, right? So we, we can't have it both ways. And that's what all of us are, have to come to terms with, not just the people in the companies. I do think the best companies actually take a step forward towards leading consumers to a better solution. Um, and that's a place where surprisingly a company like Walmart, even though it's a company that's built on the idea that they want to encourage consumption, they have reduced the amount of excess that is consumed with, uh, with staple products, for example. So that's okay. an interesting. This is great. But do we this need 10 Barbies? You know, does any kid need 10 Barbies? My grandmother would say no. <laughs> like... Yes, I agree with your grandma. <laughs> but uh, it, it's very hard to resist a, a, a five or a six year old uh, girl who's, who's insisting on buying it because of peer pressure. Right. Okay. Now, I just have one comment, which is interesting. Uh, it fits with your statement about purpose. One of our earlier uh, webinar speakers was actually almost in the summer, was Colin Mayer from uh, Oxford University. Mm -hmm. He's very much involved in the uh, economics of mutuality. He says the purpose of a corporation is to create financial value from solving problems for the environment or and social and not creating problems. Mm -hmm which is, I think it's a very strong <laughs> statement. Yeah, that's a Milton Friedman statement. I don't agree with that. And I think uh, history I doesn't agree with that. So there's a okay. wonderful, wonderful book by a woman named Lynn Stout, a legal scholar called The Shareholder Value Myth. Um, and Lynn Stout uh, rightly points out that for pretty much from the, the financial crisis of the late 1800s all the way through the middle of the century into the 70s, when the Chicago School of Economics really gained power, corporations were not looked at as shareholder wealth creation machines. They were considered to be great institutions, right? The, they were great institutions that had obligations to the communities in which they operated they were expected to provide employment. Uh, almost all of the healthcare benefits um, in many economies actually came initially through, uh, through companies and through employment. So especially after World War II, that was the case. Um, so I think history actually shows that there are other ways for companies to function in society and that when they did function in those ways as great institutions, our society was more collectively prosperous. And there was a compression of wealth between the very highest and the very lowest uh, earners in our society that benefited everybody, including the very highest. I mean, how many pairs of pants can a rich person buy, <laughs> right? It's not gonna, it's not gonna be, you know, pushing all the wealth upward is not going to make for a healthy society. Absolutely. Now, um, I'm going to open the Q&A from the audience. And uh, please, if you have a question or a comment, please write it in the chat box. And uh, I will uh, probably ask you to sort of uh, 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 speak, speak it up to uh, Catherine. I have a, a bunch of questions from uh, my colleague, Sherwet. Uh, Sherwet, would you please uh, unmute? Hello, thank you. Um, what a bunch. It's like just whatever comes. Hello, Catherine. Hello, Welcome to Lovely to have you with us, really. Um, me and Ali work very closely in the area, especially of supply chain uh, sustainability. And uh, what we're talking about 
I'm not going there. So, um, well, thank you for your work there. Thank you. All right. So, but the, on the other hand, um, the title of the book is one of the things that attracted me and um, the 21st century. So what features or what chapters exactly, maybe uh, the ones that you didn't present that would make it different for the 21st century than if I would write this book maybe a decade ago, a couple of decades ago? I think the communications expectation is probably what makes it 20, more 21st century. That and also the disclosure expectations so, uh, you know, our communications environment today is both vertical and lateral. And I think that is a huge departure even from just 20 years ago um, and instantaneous. So uh, it's more important for a company to think through very carefully what their, their standing message can be, because that has to live for a period of of time that exceeds the typical communications cycle. So the companies that have done this best, most effectively are, are, are companies who have experienced crises. And I think um, BP is a great example of this where they've actually now stuck with the same message for a decade since the deep water horizon. And they have recovered in terms of their reputational, um, their reputational capital in a way that Exxon has still not uh, recovered from the Valdez disaster in uh, the late 80s, early 90s. So very, uh, I, that's an interesting, the comparison of those two is an interesting case, I think. Also the disclosure um, environment is very different today than it was last century and it is becoming even more complex. So, um, getting people and companies to think about what's expected of them in terms of the data that are collected is a, is a sea shift that's still on, ongoing. Okay. Because again, so, so uh, globalize, you know, the themes for 21st for me would be like technology, globalization, disintegration of the firm, the large corporate firms. Were these, were any specific chapters in those? Because I'd like to assign them for a reading if that's the case. No, there, those themes are kind of woven throughout, but there isn't a chapter on those. But that's a, a great idea. I should talk to Dave about doing a reboot. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, uh, Nesma Dredi, please uh, unmute. Yes. Hi. Hi. Hi Nisma. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Yeah. And I just had a question regarding, uh, it was actually a debate we had the uh, Sure. Uh, the I'm sorry. Hi. Uh, the debate we had in uh, class regarding the SDGs you mentioned. So we were discussing whether it is what is more effective or what's a better approach to uh, address multiple ones or to focus more on a few or ones that could add more value and focus on that. So I just wanted to know your opinion in that sense. You mean picking a handful of the 17 goals? Exactly. Like, should you pick a handful or should you pick a few? less and focus on them. I think the company should should select the goals that it has the opportunity and expertise to impact. So um, only in a handful of cases have we seen companies go across the 17. Coca-Cola is a not notable example um, because they do touch pretty much every dimension of, of, um, of those goals. So uh, most companies are not going to have the resources to, to do all, but we would advise that companies should pick any that they have the capability um, and any where their operating context uh, touches those goals. Strategy is choice. I'm sure your professor said that to you. You can't do everything well, so you have to choose what you can do well. Uh, I have a question from uh, Muhammad uh, El Bilbawi, please. Yes, hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for your time for this very, very interesting and insightful uh, webinar. Uh, I just wanted to ask, I noticed in chapter four that one of the do's was involve business leaders in corporate citizenship. Mm -hmm. So... And I also genuinely believe that just one or two business or a group of businesses are not enough to make a significant impact. It needs to go global. It needs to go wide scale to see some significant impact on community and the environment. So how does one or a handful of business leaders who actually believe in sustainable practices and corporate 
corporate responsibility fr- friendly practices to encourage others in their network and their suppliers perhaps uh, and and their network the, the businesses they deal with to also engage in corporate citizenship how do they do that to get a network of or maybe a whole industry to engage in mm-hmm. sustainable practices so oftentimes how we see this happen is again through crisis right what will happen is there will be um a problem in a particular industry and the a group of companies. So one notable example is when you think about what ha- happened with Foxconn or um, the Chinese name is Hanhe, um, with the, the young people, uh, workers actually committing suicide because the working conditions were so bad, right? So at those Foxconn factories, that's a three square mile um, factory complex with thousands of workers being imported from rural areas in China. It's imagine sending your college age child off to basically a work camp and they get there and um, they're adolescents who are put in these very difficult conditions. And there was a terrible crisis. And the company's first response was to just issue a statement saying nothing to see here. Their second response was to get the workers to sign a pledge agreeing not to commit suicide. Their third response was to put nets around the building so that if anybody jumped from the building, they wouldn't hit the ground. So none of those responses were satisfactory, but it took the media exposing those three responses for the group of American and international telecoms companies whose devices were being produced in those factories to get together and say, this is not acceptable. No one of them, as big as they were, had the, uh, had the heft to be able to get the attention of the company leaders or the government of China to get the central government's attention, um, but together they did. So they created what is called the, corp- the, the Electronics Industry, EICC, Elect- Electronics Industry Citizenship Council. And there were 30 companies together who said, this is our human rights uh, code of conduct. You must observe this code of conduct. If you don't observe this code of conduct, you're not losing one of us, you're losing all of us. So it was, a, it was basically a block that was created to, um, to get compliance. And voluntary standards organizations is one means by which these uh, business leader networks are created. I I also want to say, I believe that corporate citizenship is important, obviously, but I do not believe that corporate citizenship is a uh, substitute for appropriate regulation. So I do believe that government has a role to play. I don't believe that we have had very effective government in many places to be able to protect workers in the environment, not to nearly to the extent that we need to do And that's an individual citizen act, right? We have to actually be the ones to push our governments to act in appropriate ways and to hold companies accountable. Um, And I think in many cases, companies would welcome (laughs) that, the business leaders, right? Especially if they're having uh, pressure from their shareholders. If there's a regulation in place that directs how they have to behave, it takes the issue of choice off the table and it levels the playing field in a way that can be better for everyone. All right. That sounds excellent. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mohammed. Uh, Noor, please. Hello, Dr. Catherine. How are you? Hello. Hello, Noor. So my question, my question to you adds on to the point that you were just concluding uh, to Biblewi, where you were talking about the role of the government, because in Dr. Shidwet's class, we were also discussing uh, the role of the government or the role of the business and the corporates when it comes to uh, corporate sustainability and to citizenship. In our opinion, when we were discussing it in the class, that obviously we acknowledge that there's a role for the government and a role for the business itself. But if we're talking about developing economies that, as you said, they might not have the regulations in hand or they don't have specific policies. So would it solely be respons- this responsibility of the corporates to handle such issues in terms of sustainability? And if, for example, in your opinion, if one corporate decides to be the sustainable one, would the others uh, follow along the pathway or how would it be in terms of developing economies? 
Yeah, that's, I mean, the, what the research tells us, what the empirical research tells us is that the, there is a first, first mover advantage in, in adopting sustainability policies. So if, and if you're not first, what goes alongside with that is if you don't get the first mover advantage, all you get is the cost, the transition cost, because the first mover has set the bar and now you don't get the, the value bump in terms of the market reaction to your, to your um, adoption, but you do have the cost of having to undertake that transition to sustainability. So we always encourage our companies to be the first mover whenever possible. If they see that it's inevitable for the company uh, to have to undertake an, an action that's in their best interest to do it sooner rather than later. Um, I don't think it is the role of companies, should not be the role of companies to lead societies to sustainability. But in many cases today, it is because of ineffective governance. And that's a, that's a social problem. I think that's a social problem. And um, I'm grateful for the instances of corporate leadership we've seen. And it's not an expectation that's sustainable. It's not what the, those CEOs signed up to do. Clear, thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, Noor. Uh, Catherine, I just have one, actually two comments. The first comment is about the SDGs, uh, picking uh, what to do. I 100% agree, agree with what you're saying. I just have a one issue. This is, you have to think of SDGs as a code of conduct. Yeah. Even though you're going to pick two or three of them to excel in them, you at least do not do harm for the others, yes. for the other SDGs. Yeah, you I cannot agree. say I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm anti-poverty, but I'm a big polluter. I agree. That kind of a thing. So you really I have agree. to think of them as a, as a code of ethics, and you cannot violate, violate them, but you can sort of add value to one or two that you, of your choice that you could do better at. Yes. Now, when you talk about governance, I mean, government is important, but also the civil so civic society organizations. When you talk about most of the labor regulations, it happened because of labor union. Right. And I tell you one interesting thing. An ILO, for example, quoted with most of the developing countries, including Egypt, is about labor union, about the right of labor to congregate and have collective action. Because this is what creates governance. Civil and society, that's, in that's, addition that's, to the others. Yes, that's the success of the EU, right? That is, if you look at a France or a Germany, developed economies that have uh, more compression of, of wages and better quality of life, universal health care, et cetera, that is their differentiator. They have the, the representation of labor and of employees on their boards of directors, and that's mandated by law. So it's not that the company decided, gee, I think this would be a good idea. That's their operating contract. That's what the society says to them is, you know, this is expected of you, you must do it. And so they do comply. Catherine, I really thank you for a very insightful webinar, great discussions. Uh, and I look forward to getting, to passing the info to the, to the, to the, uh, all the participants. And I'm gonna put it also on our website for the benefit of all. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is the last webinar of the fall semester and 2020. And I think we had a very good uh, finale. And uh, it's a really great finale. I thank you, Catherine, for this. We look forward to seeing you next year in the spring semester. We aim to offer same quality of speakers and the variety of topics related to social impact. Please stay tuned and check our social media for our new schedule for the spring started, uh, starting from... Uh, February. Thanks. Catherine, I'll, I'll like, and I see questions coming in. If you want to send them to me, I'm happy to try to answer them. I will take you on that offer. Uh, thank okay. you. Happy holidays and stay safe. Thank you. Have a great new year. Bye-bye. Thank you, Kat.